Good morning. Good morning. And let's get, begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we so much need your presence, your love, your truth, your transforming energy in our hearts and minds and in the world around us. We ask that you'll join us today, that we can draw near to you, and that we can be true lights in this world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Uh, one announcement that I'm going to make today, it has to do with our orders, and it's primarily for all those online, I, and I want to tell you that, that uh, I'm going to give you some clues on the whole ordering process if you want a more efficient res to receive your orders more quickly. Number one, use the um, website store to place your order. If you send an email, uh, leave a phone voicemail, uh, send a text, uh, there is a, a real possibility that that order could be lost. Uh, we have one uh, full-time employee, Francesca, and she has many responsibilities and duties, and she will do her best to get that down and get that taken care of, but it could easily be lost. It goes into the order queue. There is an actual uh, program that, that will, will track that, and then we have to process that and to check that off, so it will, will, will be tracked. So use the order, the store, to place your order. Second, if you want it timely, are free giveaways. When we do our monthly giveaway that we're doing right now, and this month we're doing, uh, if you have a U.S. Postal address, the God-shaped heart, if you order just what is available there, one, three, five, whatever we make available, you can order within that range and just order it and don't add to it, it becomes what we call a standard order, and we have volunteers that come in, and we kind of can do a, a uh, assembly line and pack those really quick and get those out. But when you make a custom order, well, I want three of these, plus I want two groups of tracks, plus I'd like some heavenly sanctuary um, investigative judgment pamphlets, and, and you want a then that becomes a one-off order, and it's more difficult to process. It delays, and if you do the standard order, you'll get it within one to two weeks. If you do the other order, it'll probably be six weeks, two months. <laughs> it could be. We're, we're trying. We, our goal is to get everything within four weeks. We just packaged up every order we had through December, and they're all boxed. They're all packaged, and now we're in the process of getting them posted. And we, we did over 800 of them last week. And uh, so your orders are coming. A couple of them, I apologize, we're all the way back to October. And, uh, but we're still working them and because uh, we only have one full-time employee. But we will get them out to you. So there's a clue on how the process works. We are doing Lesson 5 in the quarterly, Isaiah. And the title is Noble Prince of Peace. And let's read Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And this is from the New King James. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of, of David and over his kingdom, to, the order, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, ever, for, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. First question, what does this verse say about the divinity of Jesus? The child born is Jesus. Yes, everybody agree. What does it say about the divinity? Well, if you think about, yes, yeah, if you think about the, uh, the Godhead, who is the counselor? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. But, but this child is going to be called counselor. Who is everlasting father? Well, the father. But this child is going to be called everlasting father. Uh, who, of course, is the Prince of Peace. We, we trip, prefer to think of Jesus that way. How can all three be said of Jesus? Does this mean there's only one individuality and Jesus is that one individuality? Or rather, does it mean that the three individualities are so united in perfection of their character of love that when you see Jesus, you see the Father and the Spirit? What? When you have seen me, you've seen the Father. That's Jesus' words. When you see me, you've seen the Father. Yes. What does the idea of Prince of Peace and the other phrase, his government and peace, mean? Prince of Peace and government and peace. Does the world today need more peace? Absolutely. Do we need the kingdom of the Prince of Peace? Yes. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. How can one achieve peace? Can we achieve? We can make peace through war. 
Can we have peace by waging war? If we wage war, will we gain more peace? Yeah, which lens are we looking through, right? And if you're saying, well, no, if we send our armies into the Middle East and we see all those things, we don't get more peace when we do that. But in Revelation 12, 7, it says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Was Michael pursuing peace when he waged war in heaven? Is the outcome of his war going to result in the government of peace that we just read about? Yes, yes it will. Yes, it will. But when you hear this word war, what law lens are you hearing it through? If you, pardon? Yeah, it, if, we, if we take the human view of law and government, rules made up, coercive in, imposition, injustice must be punished, War then is won through conquest, through force, through might, through power, through killing the armies or the enemies that one has and, th and, and forcing them into submission. This is how we achieve peace. But if we understand design law, then we understand that peace is achieved by destroying the elements that cause division and hostility. So we destroy lies, fear, selfishness out of the hearts of intelligent beings. That was, that's what we destroy and that's the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war like the world does. The weapons we use are not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. And notice what we're demolishing. Every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought. thought. So there's a war but our weapons demolish lies about God. And they win hearts to love and trust. Can you win hearts to love and trust by using force and violence? You see this all then, putting it all together. I hope your computers are going with me now. You have other Bible texts dropping into your, you know, your visual screen in your head. Uh, because it fits perfectly with Revelation 12, 7, the war in heaven, doesn't it? And the war, the word translated war in Revelation, the Greek is polemos. Polemos, from where we get polemic. And the word in English, the English word polemic means a controversial argument as one against some opinion or doctrine. The war was a war of ideas or words. Who do you trust? Is God this way or that way? Satan is the father of lies. This is how he wages war. God fights the war with the divine weapons of truth, love, and freedom. And along that lines, under the umbrella of truth, and these things are evidence and revelation. These are ways truth is brought forth, evidence and revelation. Satan fights with lies, deception, flattery, coercion, manipulation, propaganda, violence, We can never get peace using Satan's methods. Never. You may get cessation of hostilities for a brief period of time. If you are strong enough, think about this. Parents, did you ever have your children fight with each other? And in the middle of the fight, the parent came in and grabbed them and pushed them to their corners. Did you ever have that kiss your brother and tell them you love them thing? Did you ever have that? <laughs> did you come? Oh, you're laughing because you did, right? And if you have enough power over them, do you get behavioral compliance? Do you get love in the heart at that moment? No. Or do you get, okay, wait till they're gone, I'm going to get you, okay? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. This is what power can do. Power can restrain but power cannot bring real peace. There's no peace in that room. There's no peace in that home. Even if there's not outright hostility. You can't get peace using that method. And do any other Bible texts come to mind along this line of government and peace? How about Psalms 119, 165? Great peace have they who love 
your law, and nothing will make them stumble. Does that mean great peace have they who have the right list of commandments and behaviorally observe them? Why do those who love God's law have great peace? Why? Is it because those who love God's law are more effective in creating better legislative enactments, better regulations? They can have better, they're better at, at, at running uh, corporations and, and they, they have uh, more righteous authoritarianism. Their rules are enforced more appropriately. Because they understand reality. Do they get the right, are they, when, when, when they love God's law, uh, do they pursue the right judges and the right politicians to vote for? That's why that, that they get more peace because they, they, they love God's law and they vote for the ones who will, will proclaim the law of God. Does this text in Isaiah that we're looking at about the government being on Jesus' shoulders, this, this prince of peace, the government in peace, being on Jesus' shoulders, does it mean that he's coming back to take over all earthly governments and to reign like an earthly ruler judicious, ju judicially, judicially, legislatively, legally, using power and force to have a tribunal? to examine evidence, to give verdicts, and to hand out punishments. Is that how he's going to reign? Do you know most of Christianity teaches yes? It's just a, and this is what the Jews were looking for 2,000 years ago, someone to reign on David's throne and kill the enemies of Israel. They, 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 and, and the problem, the reason they think this, is because they've accepted the lie that God's law works like human law, a system of rules that require enforcement. This is the great infection. <coughs> and who is coming to give them a kingdom like this? <laughs> Satan is coming, pretending to be Christ, and will, will operate exactly like this. It's Satan's grand strategy, infect the minds with a lie that God's government and law works like human government, have injustice happen in society, and then come as a powerful supreme being who will bring justice about. But if you accept this lie that God's law works like human law, everything is corrupted by it. Everything. All of Christianity. The cross is corrupted into a legal process in which God places the sins of the world on Jesus and God legally executes the substitute in our place and kills his son on the cross to pay the legal penalty for our sin and thus God becomes the inflictor of death, the source of death. He kills. That's Satan's view of God. The wicked are tortured and killed by God in the end who they fear rather than love. Theologies are taught and embraced by the people that are designed to hide us and protect us from God, uh, covered by the robe of righteousness, intercessor pleading with the Father so he won't hurt us because people don't trust him because they accept the lie that he has to enforce his law by killing the disobedient. And, and what happens in this penal legal view, understand very clearly, folks, people who claim faith in God in this view, they actually don't have faith in God. They don't trust him. They have faith in the legal payment that keeps him from hurting them. But they don't have faith in him. You see the difference? I have faith that the blood of Jesus is sufficient to pay my penalty so that God can't legally kill me. Because I don't trust him. This is what this corruption does. Holiness is perverted to rule-keeping performance and, and obedience to law. Churches are fractured as they fight over right definitions or doctrines or terms or mechanics of worship or rituals. Justice is distorted to accurate record keeping and just infliction of punishment. People are deceived into believing justice can be achieved through legislative enactment and human governments. The beastly system of revelation, you hear what I'm about to say now, the beastly system of revelation will not arise advancing and seeking injustice. It will not arise with leaders that wear red capes, horns, and hold red pitchforks. 
It's not going to rise that way. It will not arise claiming to promote evil. It will arise pursuing justice. The specific justice doesn't matter, it's pursuing. It might be racial justice. It might be economic justice. It might be environmental justice. It might be justice for the unborn. But whatever justice the system pursues and advances will be through the mechanics of human governments, legislative enactments, coercive enforcement, fines, sanctions, no one can buy or sell, revocation of business licenses, restrictions of freedom, such as restriction to travel unless you meet the requirements of the, of the coercive government, Assem restrictions of assembly on speech, canceling memberships or, or resources, imprisonment, and eventual death penalties. Do we see this shaping up, folks? If you uh, don't uh, pray for eyes to have the Holy Spirit because it's shaping up right now, the beast is, is coming to ascendancy. All of this in the pursuit of justice, of doing what is right to save the planet, to save life. We must save lives to protect the innocent, the downtrodden, the exploited, the oppressed, but all through the mechanics of Satan's methods and principles. And when we embrace his methods and principles and begin practicing them to achieve justice, we corrupt our own hearts and minds with his character. And if it were possible, this deception is going to be so powerful, the pursuit of this righteous or justice is going to be so powerful that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived by it. And I see it happening. So many right now are being taken in. We can never achieve God's goals through Satan's methods. Never can we have justice through the kingdoms of this world. Never. Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God is within you. Understand God's kingdom is the kingdom of truth, love, and freedom. And think about these three elements and the use of coercive power. Truth, love, and freedom and the use of coercive power, the methods of the world. Can you get people to believe and accept truth by threatening them with punishment if they don't believe the truth? Can you get them to believe and accept truth by threatening to punish them if they won't believe the truth? What's the old saying? A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. This is why in Romans 14, every person is to be fully persuaded in their own mind. We present the truth in love and we leave people free. Truth cannot win hearts by threatening to kill those who won't accept the truth. What about can you get more love by threatening to kill people who don't love? No. Can you get more freedom by imprisoning the people and punishing people who don't value freedom? Understand the great trap of Satan that millions of Christians and, and non-Christians are falling into. God's law functions like human law and justice can be achieved through human laws, human systems, human governments, human justices, human politicians. We can get, it's a lie, it's a trap. Yes? Question, like psychiatry, psychology, whatever. Um, in times past, when I was going through an educational system sponsored by a certain denomination, um, I was told that if we all get people going the same direction, eventually they will learn to trust and love because they have now assimilated the behavior and then they will become true believers. So in other words, if you act like it, then eventually you will become it or whatever. Is there a psychological pathway to that? or So, so you mixed a couple of things, okay? Well, you mixed a couple of things. You, system you, you, no, you mixed uh, uh, love and trust in there. Okay. Um, the law of exertion. If you exercise something, it gets stronger. If people begin marching to the same tune and singing the same song and acting the same way and reinforcing same behaviors, then over the course of time, those do get wired in and there can be a uniformity that is achieved through those mechanics. However, that does not mean love and trust is growing. Because love, uh, well, trust requires trustworthiness. And just because people are doing those mechanics doesn't mean they're actually trustworthy. 
Okay, and so it, I, I would I would dispute you get love and trust that way, but you certainly can get uniformity, and you can get a superficial. This is this is what uh, cults do. Cults condition and require. Uh, uh, it's also the conditioning in military groups where they will put you in a platoon and they will send you through basic training and they give you a very regimented routine and you will dress the same and you will get up the same and you will eat at the same time and you will sleep at the same time and you'll go through the same uh, physical training routines and you will be indoctrinated with the same systems of uh, philosophical belief that the military or unit wants you to have and, and to those who can't assimilate, they're kicked out uh, and those who can, and this is the, 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 the religious system that you, you describe, it's very, very active in um, selecting in, selection bias, selecting the compliers and, and, um, and uh, disciplining or um, rejecting the, uh, the uh, free thinkers, let's say, okay? So, yeah, no, I don't think you get love and trust by simply going along. You have to be persuaded in your mind. You have to comprehend. You have to understand. It's the only way. And we'll unpack this some more as we go on. Listen to this quote under the context of what we were just talking about. We cannot get God's goals using Satan methods. And the big trap of Satan is to get people to believe you can get justice through human systems. So I found this historic quote um, from Signs of the Times, April 28, 1890. Uh, and it says the following. Uh, in these days, it is Satan's determined purpose to intensify sin by making it legal in the children of disobedience. He is, to reveal, he is to reveal to the world and to heaven what is the order and result of a government carried on according to his ideas of administration and law. Get, get, get. He is to reveal what does imperialism, what does imposed rules, what does legislation, what does force and coercion in government look like? He is, it's going to be revealed. He is working with secret yet he is working with secret yet with intense zeal in both the church and the state to cause men to throw off all the restraints of God's law and take a decided stand with him in the ranks of rebellion. Notice the process. Satan is very legal. He wants things done legally. But his laws are imposed, made up rules, legislated, declared, enacted, that require external enforcement. God's laws are the laws reality operate upon. They're constants. They never waver. Satan's laws, there's all types of manipulation, all types of special favors. Judges can rule to enforce or not enforce. You can bribe your way around them. You can skirt your way. You can cheat the system. It happens all the time with these types of laws. Those with connections and, 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 uh, and power are not held to the same standard of what, what, what the law requires than those without the connections and that power. But guess what? Gravity treats everyone exactly the same. The laws of health treat everybody. If you don't eat, uh, don't eat right and you never exercise, you will not get physically stronger. The laws of exertion, the laws of God make no discrimination. They treat everyone the same. It is your response to those laws that make the difference. But that's not human law. That's not Satan's. Satan's system is constantly trying to get you to understand fair and unfair through an arbitrary made-up system of rules, which is never fair and unfair. Even when it's applied to the best of someone's ability. Just think of every game. Games are all made up rules that people play. Professional sport games. Even when the umpires and referees are applying themselves to the best of their ability to be as righteous as possible, to only make the fairest calls, do they always see it exactly right? Or do they still sometimes make calls that are wrong? And the wrong team wins because the, there was a bad call. Not maliciously. You can't have. But it doesn't matter what the umpire calls when seven people jump off a building. I call that person to float. <laughs> doesn't matter. God's laws treat everyone the same. See the trap. This is it. Uh, we only have a government of peace from the Prince of Peace by restoring God's law in the hearts and minds of people. And that then, every citizen of that government is trustworthy. That's why we have peace. 
Some object. Are you saying we should not care about social injustice or doing social justice? Are you, are, uh, uh, should we just ignore abuses of our fellow human beings? Should, should Christians just ignore things like slavery when it was happening uh, because you can't get justice through human governments? This is what people will do. It's a false argument based on people still thinking you can get justice through human governments. And slavery is a great example of looking at this. It's a great example. The critics of the Bible will look at the New Testament and through human law, and they won't find anything in the New Testament in which the New Testament condemns slavery. You don't find a statement, slavery is condemned by God, it is an evil and should not be participated in. It's not in the New Testament. You won't find anything in the New Testament from Jesus or the apostles directing slaves to run away from their masters. In fact, you will find just the opposite you will find New Testament writers directing slaves to return to their masters. You won't find anything in the New Testament directing the Christians to begin advocating politically to get new senators or governors in, in Roman po politics so they can overthrow the laws of slavery and have slaves set free. You won't find an abolitionist movement through the governments of man. And therefore, the critics of the Bible look at that and say, it is an immoral book. Because it doesn't seek human or social justice. Because it doesn't seek to overthrow slavery. But that's because they're trapped in the lie of Satan. That justice is achieved through human governments. I'm going to propose to you that in fact, with every social injustice, including slavery, the Bible is aggressively attacking it to destroy it. And overthrow it. And what would happen... And notice how the New Testament aggressively attacked slavery to overthrow it. But it did not attack it through Satan's lies and systems of imperial law and coercive pressure and force. You think about, uh, before I even explain how the Bible did it and how it attacks it, let me show you if you follow Satan's lie. Follow Satan's lie to overthrow slavery and what do you get? War. And you get millions killed in war and you get more orphans, and you get more wounded, and you get more PTSD, and you get more hatred, and you get more violence, and you get more destruction of souls lost to the kingdom of God. But hey, we're pursuing justice. It's the right thing to do. That's the methods of the world. We see it happening in society right now in this pursuit of social justice. So how did the Bible do it? Well, what would happen to every slave if the gospel takes root in the heart's of every person and every person loves each other like God loves us or they love their own spouse or their child or themselves what would happen to slavery if everybody loved each other that way and saw and value each person as a child of God what happens to slavery it's gone it evaporates it goes away so I'm gonna suggest the Bible did attack slavery and every other form of social injustice but it attacked it where it can actually make a real outcome and not the false illusion of pretended social justice by advocating for one social injustice through methods that bring a cascade of other social injustice at the same time. Mm -hmm. Think about what you have to do to prosecute a war. Not only those who are in the, in the battle, but think of all of the various people who have to be exploited in order to support the war machine and the injustices that happened to them and their families. The draft and the children taken from homes and put into the war, and the injustice to that family to set this justice right. Is it fair? Oh yes, because that's, that, that, that's wrong. We have to set it right. This is the trap. Millions are being duped. You see it right now. It just makes me sick to see what's happening in our society right now. Understand there is a difference from being a Protestant than one who embraces Satan's kingdom and methods. A Protestant is a person, a genuine, true Protestant, is a person who protests by truth, love, and freedom with God's methods. You stand up in the avenues, circles, and spheres where you have influence, you speak the truth in love, and you leave people free. And the truth converts hearts of men, and as hearts of men and, and women are converted, societies are transformed. There's a place for Protestant protestations, but those protesting 
um, avenues or actions are through lifting up the truth to people to set their hearts and freeze from the lies, biases, prejudice, selfishness, fears in their hearts. And that's what we do at Come and Reason Ministry. We protest all human injustice, but via God's methods, truth, love, freedom. Yes? In the protest against slavery in the late 18th century in England, the housewives cut sugar production by 55% in just a couple of years. That's a genuine protest. To, oh, to end slavery. Cut, cut sugar production or cut sugar demand Some. use? Okay. Consumption, not production. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cut, yeah. So they stopped using sugar because slaves were being used to make sugar. And so they, they made a change in their own behavior that would, do, that would economically hurt those who were exploiting the slaves by no longer consuming the sugar. Okay. That was not a, through legislative action. That was not through demand. It was through an action that they could take in government. You know what? I, do, I don't support this mechanism for getting sugar, so I'll stop using it to, to help uh, undermine the profits of those who are exploiting the slaves. Okay, great. Yeah, Sunday's lesson, Isaiah has us read Isaiah 19 through 22. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, you should not, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of, light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. That then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. What's happening in this text? People are not looking to God for truth. They're looking to other sources than God for truth. Spiritists whispering, muttering, the dead, and so forth. Very quickly, I'm not going to spend time, much time on this, but what is spiritualism in all its forms? Remember, if you look for this definition, you can essentially identify it no matter how it appears. It is the pursuit of knowledge without the investigation of evidence or the use of reason. That's what spiritualism is in all its forms. Saul went to the witch of Endor because he wanted what? Knowledge. knowledge. But he didn't consult God. He didn't investigate. He didn't reason. And then tarot cards, palm reading, astrology, tea leaves and chicken bones, seances, Ouija boards, automatic writing, every form of it is pursuing what? Knowledge. But without actual comparing to evidence or using reason. That's spiritualism. So look for it. And then, what is wrong with pursuing the occult, spiritualism? What's wrong with using these methods? Why is it wrong? Because God said it. God said it's wrong. Don't do it. Therefore, it's wrong. Is that why it's wrong? Or is it wrong? Therefore, God tells us it's wrong because so, he doesn't want us to be confused. It opens you up to false things. I like where you're going. It opens you up. So you could ask this question. What happens to people who utilize or practice these methods? They're susceptible to non-truth. Yeah. Ah, susceptible to non-truth. So, why do people who turn to the occult, according to the passage, end up in darkness? There's no light to where they're going. That's how reality works, folks. Why do people who put blindfolds folds on have darkness? <laughs> okay. That's how reality works. It doesn't matter their intention. It doesn't matter if they have a good heart. It doesn't matter if they're motivated by love. If someone drinks poison, thinking and hoping and praying that they'll get healthier, they will not get healthier drinking poison. And the person who puts a blindfold on themselves and gets behind the wheel of a car to drive will not have a good experience. <laughs> Rejecting truth and embracing lies never enlightens. It only darkens. The occult is the domain of the father of lies and his minions and will only darken, confuse, pervert, damage, and destroy. That's the only outcome you can get there. doesn't matter if you hope and wish and dream and, and your intentions were good you will still not find light there. As I was thinking about this moral darkness described here, 
Uh, I remembered an article uh, written by uh, Ellen White, published in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, and entitled, God Made Manifest in Christ. And it is talking about the first advent. And before I read some of this, we won't do the whole article, we're going to do a good bit of it, and we're going to unpack it. I think you're going to find it quite profoundly insightful. But, but as we do this, remember, what kind of war are we in? Okay, what are the weapons that we use? Okay, what are we to demolish? Okay, and so as we approach the second advent, consider the description of the circumstances and things going on in the world at the time of Christ's first advent. And let's go into the article. At the first advent of Christ, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. Pause. Darkness about what? Was this darkness that covered the earth and the people uh, only darkness for the non-Jewish people? Or were the Jews also in darkness? Does this have any parallels to our time today? The second advent is coming. Does darkness cover the minds of people? Yes. Only the non-Christians or Christians too? Only the non-Adventists or Adventists too? Oh. Let's continue with the next, the next sentence. Light and truth seem to have departed from among men, and Satan appeared to reign in undisputed power. Pause. How was Satan reigning? Did he have a physical throne and, and a castle and, and he sat on and reigned? Or was he reigning, uh, in this description, in the hearts and minds of people through his lies, his methods, and his principles, which are imposed rules which increase injustice after injustice through legal means that we just read about? Remember, slavery then was legal. All the abuses of the Pharisees were legal. They hated Jesus because he broke their laws. Okay? All their made up rules he kept breaking and they hated him. He was a lawbreaker, they alleged. Understand Satan's kingdom is legislative rules and enforcement and the light and truth. And he was reigning in undisputed power. We see it today. Keep on with the quote. Rival sects existed. And among those who professed to be the servants of God were displayed love of preeminence and strife for power and position. Do we see rival sects in society today? Or should we say rival political parties? Do we see those rival sects claiming to be promoting the good of the people, but in reality they love preeminence and fight for power and position over others? Isn't this profound? Keep going. Souls who were desirous of light were filled with perplexity and sorrow. Are many people today desperate for light, searching for what is right? Do we find that? People perplexed, fearful, sorrowful. Continuing on. Many were sighing, what is truth? How many today are saying, what is truth? There is no truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Do we hear the same thing? Ignorance prevailed. But many were looking for something better, looking for light that would illuminate the moral darkness of the world. Does ignorance about God and God's design laws for life prevail in the world today? And many are looking for something better, for light that will illuminate the moral darkness of this world. But where will they find it when the churches are infected with the imposed law lie and collude with the governments practicing imperial methods and coercion just like the Pharisees 2,000 years ago. Is that your quote? Is that you saying that? That was me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Here's the next part of the quote. They were thirsting, the people were thirsting for a knowledge of the living God, for some assurance of a life beyond the tomb. What was the darkness over back then? Knowledge of the living God. What were they desperate for? What about people today? 
The same author who describes this darkness at the time of Christ that was covering the world says in another place, in Christ's Object Lessons 4.15, describing today, quote, it is the darkness and misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, today, folks, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love, end quote. Just as the time of the first advent, so now at the time of the second advent, people are hungering for the knowledge of the living God. And God is calling for a people today to tell this end time message, which is the truth about his character of love, rejecting the imposed law, dictator God, and turning people's mind to the creator who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Continuing on with the quote. Christ came just as prophecy had foretold. He was the way, the truth, and the life. And the beams of the capital S-U-N, S-U-N, capital, son of righteousness, the beams of the son of righteousness dispelled the moral darkness so that the honest in heart might see the truth. And Christ will come a second time just as prophecy has foretold. I'm going to read to you Malachi 4, 1 and 2. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble, and that day is, that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left of them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, will rise with healing in his wings. And consider if you were in a dark cave for many hours and you were brought out at noon, how that would be on a bright day, versus you're brought out before dawn and you're allowed to watch the sun rise. See, which is easier? Christ is rising right now at this end of time with healing in the rays that come, the healing light and the healing truth. Those of us who love the truth, embrace it, apply it, are being transformed by it so that we can enjoy more and more of it so that when he appears in his life-giving glory, we will say, this is our God, we will, and we will stand in that presence. But those who have been rejecting, because the, the sun's rising, some of us are embracing it, some of us are rejecting it and saying, no, justice is through the system of law and the system of rule enforcement. And they're rejecting the light of God's kingdom. And they are becoming more and more hardened in the darkness of these methods of this world. And when he comes in his glory, they will not enjoy it. They will cringe and beg for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from him who sits on the throne. Those of us who love the truth, though, and are assimilating it, understand who you become right now in real time in this world of darkness. You become light in the world. The light of God's love and truth in the world of moral darkness. We are the ones who are God's final witnesses, the ones who reveal God's love and methods that are contrary to the methods of the world. And we will be hated by the world. Continuing on. The Savior of the world proposed that no attraction of an earthly character would call men to his side. The light and beauty of celestial truth alone should be the drawing power. And so today, God cannot win hearts and minds to love and trust by might, power, intimidation, more legislation, great signs, wonders, in uh, any type of coercion, you can't win it. Only truth presented in love, leaving people free, can win the heart and win the war. And the reason? Because it's God's goal to heal hearts and minds, and that requires the free will participation of the person. If God were to use divine power, which he has, to overwrite your rebellion and to write in his perfection without your willful agreement and participation, you cease to exist. You just got erased. It's not you anymore. You're a robot, a puppet, or perhaps he creates a new being like Adam and Eve in Eden that's sinless but immature and childish and, untrust, un, un, and not trustworthy yet because they haven't settled. 
They haven't developed their character by choice. The out, continue with the quote, the outward glory, the worldly honor, which attracts the attention of men, he would not, Christ would not assume. He made himself accessible to all, teaching the pure, exalted principles of truth as that which was alone worthy of their notice. But the methods of Satan, the methods of the world, are not truth. They're lies, deception, pomp, intimidation. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, you can look for this. You want to see movements afoot? The truth can afford to be fair. It loses nothing by investigation. If you're a lover of truth and you have a certain idea, but you love the truth and you accept that in the truth that you're finite and that you don't know all things, you're not God, that your current understanding uh, will develop and expand as you journey forward in the truth. So there may be ideas you have to give up as you embrace better ideas that come from the throne of heaven, uh, that you are open to that. You are not intimidated. You're not frightened by new evidence, new perspectives to, to prayerfully study and examine. But if you hold positions based on lies and you don't love the truth, then you cannot tolerate voices that bring challenging ideas that challenge your views. You will want to silence those voices. <coughs> and every kingdom of Satan destroys free speech. Every communist country, there's never been one that has an actual free press. You can't have one because truth will destroy the system. And as you see movements afoot that are censoring, that are silencing voices that disagree, not defeating those voices with better arguments and evidences and truths, but simply using power to shut them down, you can be sure those are not movements of the Spirit of God. Amen. You can understand. And if you're on the side of those folks, you should really reflect on that. Am I being part of a beastly system? Am I being duped? Yes, you are. <clears throat> That's the course of methods of the prince of this world. <coughs> Continue on to quote. Christ came to represent the Father. We behold in him the image of the invisible God. He clothed his divinity with humanity and came to the world that the erroneous idea Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. What was the central issue in the war? Remember, we fight and we demolish everything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Okay? The truth about God's character of love is the central issue. This is why an angel could not be our savior because the allegations were not against angels. Angels could reveal to us angels. Angels cannot give us the full revelation of God. Yes, angels can give us some, we can give revelation of God. We cannot give full revelation of God, but we can reveal what God has done in our life and that reveals certain things. We can be his witnesses, but we can't look to you or me to see God. Not in his full, only, only one equal to God could do that. We could not behold the glory of God unveiled in Christ and live. That was a quote. We could not behold the glory of God unveiled in Christ and live. Why? Is there a rule written in heaven that you, this is unpermiss impermissible? And if you get caught peeking, I'll have to kill you? <laughs> or is it a function of reality? It's a function of reality. And if those who Christ came to save couldn't live in unveiled glory, and he's here with his self-sacrificial love to die as our Savior, that's why he's coming and we couldn't live. What will it be like for the wicked in the end? It's a function of reality. This is not an infliction by a judicial magistrate using power to kill. That's not how reality works. That's Satan's lie. Understand how deeply infected the world is. And this is why the whole world is intoxicated on the wine of Babylon. This is the wine, this core root lie that, 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 just, that God's law works like human law, that justice is achieved through right legislation and right judicial action, and God has a, has, a, has a trial or tribunal in heaven, and he sits as a judicial magistrate doing, this is all corrupt, it intoxicates. And it makes people do irrational things like pursuing a just outcome through unjust means. Continuing on with the quote. 
But as he came in the garb of humanity, we may draw nigh to our Redeemer. We are called upon to behold the Lord our Father in the person of his Son. Christ came to save fallen man, and Satan, with fiercest wrath, met him on the field of conflict. Pause. Was this a fit? Did they, did they have, a, you know, jousting? You know, they were... Uh, uh, swords, uh, did they have, uh, you know, did they, the old west, they, they, they drew down on each other. Uh, I mean, is this how he met him on the field of conflict? Was it a physical battle of might? Understand it was not. Satan attacked Christ. I'm going to show you. It's a progression and a strategy. First attack was by deception and lies, pretending to be an angel from heaven. He presented himself as something he was not. Just trying to deceive. Lies and who he is. Second, by false theology, misquoting scripture. From himself first, misquoting it and misapplying it, but then from his human agents who, if you read the Gospels, constantly misquoted and misrepresented scripture trying to trap Jesus in false theology. Okay? So how does Satan uh, do war? Deceives, having people come to you presenting to be agents of God when they're not agents of God. False theologies that trap the minds of people. Third, bribes. All the kingdoms of the world he'll offer bribes and uh, inducements and offerings of some reward. Just give in. Just give in. You'll get a good payoff. Life's better. You'll advance. If you, you get a promotion, you'll get a better paycheck. Just give in. And fourth, coercion, threat, abuse, ultimately torture and death through, through the application of human laws. Jesus was tried. Jesus was convicted. Jesus was sent to the place of Roman execution. It was unjust in the pursuit of justice. These are Satan's methods, the methods of earthly governments. They lie. Earthly governments lie. They deceive. They financially incentivize and bribe with tax inducements and, and a power and position and privilege, and they ultimately coerce and imprison and, they ex and, and execute. And the laws are just like in Jesus' case, easily manipulated with perjurers and uh, deciding by the one in power to have a trial when the law says you can't have a trial after dark, but we'll do it anyway because we have the power to do it. You can easily manipulate human imperial laws. Mm -hmm. Satan's kingdom. For the enemy knew that when divine strength was added to human weakness, man was armed with power and intelligence and could break away from the captivity in which he had bound him. What divine strength and power? When we're armed with divine strength and power, to, uh, armed with our human weakness is armed with it, we can break away from the captivity. What are the divine weapons we talked about? Truth, Truth and love. And mm -hmm. What is it that captivates us or enslaves us? What are we captured by? Lies. lies. And what is it that destroys lies? And the truth will set you free. free. And what else besides lies holds us captive? Fear. Fear and selfishness or survival drives or the Bible calls carnal or sinful nature. Our own corrupt, fearful, survival-driven nature holds us captive as well. The me first drive. And what is it that destroys fear and selfishness? Love. Love. So truth destroys lies, wins us to trust. We open the heart and the spirit comes in. It says it pours his love into our hearts. And perfect love casts out all fear. fear. And we then do not seek justice to punish those who would hurt us or to control the environment or control the nation so that we can make sure we feel safe, deal with our fear by using power over others to make us feel safe. We've got the power. We're safe. Instead, we don't live in fear, and we love our enemies, and we pray for those who would misuse us. We're set free to do that. Do you understand the freedom there is to actually love the person who wants to kill you? Jesus came to give us his power of truth and love, to break us free from the systems of this world. But notice what the author writes next. Here we go. 
Satan sought to intercept every ray of light from the throne of God. He sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men might lose the true views of God's character and that the knowledge of God might become extinct on the earth. Is this the situation today? Has God been forgotten from the earth? Is it considered reasonable for people to believe in God today? Or is that only for the uneducated and the foolish? Because we know we evolved from lower life forms. Or even those who are still church going, do they present the true character of God? Or all too often do we get the imperial dictator who will torment people in hell for their sins if they don't get the blood payment of Jesus on their accounts? Just like the Jews 2,000 years ago, believed in God, but the shadow of Satan's view cast over their minds and they saw a dictator God whose rules they had to keep. Do you see why God needs an end time people to call us back to, to call the world back to creative worship? Continue on. He has caused truth of vital importance. This is the enemy, Satan. has caused truth of vital importance to be so mingled with error that it has lost its significance. Vital truth mixed with error, it becomes insignificant anymore. I'm going to pause. What do you think that truth is? What might be the error that is mixed in that corrupts the vital truth? Hear what comes next. Very next sentence. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. What's the error? The design law of God was burdened with needless exaction traditions by accepting the lie that it's not design law. It functions like human law systems as rules. You see, design law never has needless exactions and traditions. It just doesn't. Everything's needful. Everything that you operate in harm to God's law is needful. You need to breathe. You need to hydrate. You need nutrition. You need to focus your mind on Jesus Christ. By beholding, we become changed. Eh, there is nothing needless in God's design laws. But human imperial law, many needless things happen and many traditions. Unless God's law becomes burdened, his character becomes corrupted. And, just, and, and more and more of them, we have to have more righteousness. We have to have more justice. We have to pass more laws. It's not fair. Oh, this person, this person uh, stepped on the grass and didn't get caught for a fine. Uh, we and on and on it goes. We have to have more laws, more law enforcers. And look at our societies and our governments and the myriad of laws and regulations that we have and how many regulators and police officers and things and enforcers and continuing. So let me continue the quote. And God, so... The law of Jehovah is burdened with needless action and tradition. And what's the consequence of that? Here's the next sentence. And God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. Wow. Why? Because when God's law is pictured as rules made up, then he necessarily must be the enforcer of those rules. He must punish. And those are arbitrary laws, so those punishments are also arbitrary punishments. And he's revengeful and he's severe. He's the punisher of rule breakers. Continuing on with the quote. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the suffering of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represents as belonging to the character of God. I can't tell you how many people email us and, and post things to us that talk about how it is righteous for us to pass the laws and punish these people. How does Satan achieve this corruption? By getting people to believe the lie about God's law. That's the root. It was what he did in heaven. It's what he's done on earth. And when you embrace that lie, then he can get the pursuit of justice through application of his methods, which corrupts the character of those who practice them. And we become like Satan in character, judgmental, critical, and willing to hurt others to, to do justice. And we become marked, either in our foreheads or our hands, with the mark of that beastly system. Continue on with the quote. We're almost done. Well, maybe not, but it, you want me to keep going, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of the earth. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. What's another Bible or theological term for setting men right and keeping men right? Atonement, Atonement would be reconciliation. Okay, that's right. It would encompass it. But setting right is justification. Keeping right is sanctification. 
The only way to justify and sanctify was to reveal the truth about God to their eyes. The only way. This was not one way amongst many. This wasn't in addition to paying the legal penalty. He also needed to reveal himself to their eyes. The only way to set and keep men right was to reveal the truth because lies believe break the circle of love and trust. Truth believed destroys lies and wins to trust. And what is setting right? Under the false law model, which is taught in Christianity in our own church, setting right is the legal setting right in an accounting book and a registry in heaven where you're declared to be righteous even though you're not. It's a fraud. It's a lie. It's corrupt. The true setting right is setting the heart right with God. Writing my law in your hearts and minds. That's the true setting right. That's real justification. A heart that was at enmity with God is changed and transformed to a heart that trusts God. That's Abraham. That men might have salvation, he came directly to man and became a partaker of his nature. The Father was revealed in Christ as altogether a different being from that which Satan had represented him to be. Altogether different? Yes, because Satan represents God as a legal magistrate rather than creator and designer of reality. He represents as a rule maker and an enforcer. Jesus came to show us completely different. And what about the world today? Is the Christian world today presenting God as revealed in Jesus or God as revealed in Zeus and Jupiter? The men, continuing with the quote, the men of his own nation, the leaders of the people were so ensnared by the deceptions of Satan that the plan of redemption for the fallen race seemed to their minds indistinct and inexplainable. What about today? Is the plan of salvation indistinguishable and unexplainable to the leaders of the world? What about to the church leaders? When they explain the penal legal system of pardon, the payment in God, just to, justly executing Jesus in our place and accepting that payment in your behalf to write pardon by your name if you accept his blood and keeping account of every sin you've ever committed and making sure that you have pardon next to each one, uh, blah, 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 blah. Are they presenting something that's reasonable, explainable, or is it completely confusing and contradictory to reality? It's Satan's system. Christ exalted the character of God attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God, not through a legal payment. Sets us right, justifies us through a revelation of God because the problem, folks, is not legal. The problem is not a problem with God's law. The problem of sin is not a problem with God's attitude. The problem is not with God's forgiveness. The problem is not with God's government. The problem of sin with his, is with the hearts and minds of people. And the hearts and minds of people have to be set right, have to be restored, have to be healed, have to be transformed. Thus, the way we are set right with God is to dispel the lies, the darkness, with the light of heavenly truth that wins to trust. And in trust, we open the heart and he infuses us with his presence to transform us in character. Well, Monday's lesson? There's several other things I, I wanted to get to. Let's see if I can just see one or two high points. There's a whole section in there about godly versus ungodly, anger, the section on um, uh, Jesus, the root and the branch. Uh, we won't talk about those. Uh, let's see. There was a section in the lesson, I think, yeah, about Thursday's lesson. It says, the bottom green section says, only the works that Christ did, which he credits to us by faith, can bring redemption. Unquote. Bottom of Thursday's lesson, the green section. Only the works that he credits to us by faith can bring redemption. What law lens do you hear this through? If you have the human law model, then we have legal accounting going on. And it's, it's a lie. The actual, if you look at the various places in Scripture that use this type of language, uh, uh, Abraham trusted God or had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness uh, in, in Romans 4 and other places. That, that Greek, credited to, has a meaning. And it's precise. And the meaning is, 
uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's translated credit, sometimes it's accounted to him. Instead of credited, it's, it's translated accounted. And it has the meaning of exactly what you would expect if an accountant examined your bank record and the accountant, forensic examiner, examined your, your bank account and at the end tallied up how much money was there and the, and the person tallied up $50 and that's what they said is in your account. They account that much is there because it's there. It's there. Okay? That's what it actually means. That his faith, his heart at enmity, the natural human heart is enemy, doesn't trust God, but he had a change of heart. His heart was set right with God, and thus, because he now had faith in God, his heart was registered, credited, accounted, recognized to be righteous, because it actually was righteous. And that's why that he who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Not be declared righteous even though we're not. That is the big lie of penal substitution theology. It's corrupt. Understand reality. Reality is a creator God who built the universe to operate in harmony with his character of love and all of his laws are perfect and, and, and bring life and health and well-being. Deviations from them destroy and injure those who are deviant. But God so loved the world, he did not want us to die, so he sent his son that whoever believes in him has their heart changed from distrust to trust shall have salvation. And thus their hearts are set right. They're justified. They're recognized as being right because they are. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and so much for your truth and so much for sending Jesus to be the light of the world. And we recognize that uh, the parallels between your first advent and your soon second advent. And Lord, we recognize how much darkness covers the world and how you need your light bearers to go out into the world and share the truth about your kingdom of heaven. And we ask that you will pour your spirit into our hearts and minds and let the light so shine in us that others can see the truth of your kingdom which lives within us. And that we will pursue justice in our world, but only through the methods and mechanisms and principles of your kingdom. And we will have discernment and ability to resist the seduction of the false justice of Satan's kingdoms of this world. We pray in your holy name. Amen.